Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I just love coming to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. It's where I get all my fine woodworking tools and a great woodworking education. Let me show you what we've got on the big show today. This time on the Highland Woodworker. Getting the best boards from a log. Meet a sawyer who cuts to the heart of the matter, showing us just how it's done. Then the finer points of laying out curves. Tim Coleman has a smart solution for folks who work solo in the shop. When I was in high school, I was the science kid. How a life in the lab inspired a new material that is bending the limits of woodworking. A moment with master woodworker Jerry Spadey. These stories and more this time on the Highland Woodworker. Well, I'm with Tad Derrickson, and we're in Spring Hill, Tennessee, and Tad, hey, it's great to be here. Uh, I've wanted to do this segment for a long time because this is the heart of woodworking. This is where fine woodworking starts. And I think you're gonna tell us the thoughts of the Sawyer, who's the first woodworker on our project. Uh, you make the first scratch pattern, I know. Uh, <laughs> What do you think about? What are the decisions that are made when you saw a log? Yep, Chuck, gr great question. So this is a piece of, of oak right here. And what we're gonna look for in this particular board or this particular log is what we can get out of it that the furniture maker can use for a complete project. Now we're, we're pretty fortunate in that this is a good size log. We can see the diameter here inside the sapwood is right at 24 inches. Okay. So this is gonna be a pretty good yielding log. Oh yeah. We do have a crack in the middle, but that's, that's something that we can work around and saw around as we manage our process. And so as I look at this, I wanna think about the three different types of cuts that I can get from this particular wood. Um, everyone's familiar with the terms flat sawn, quarter sawn, and rift sawn, but really we can see in this what that's gonna mean. So as we look at this, we wanna think of literally a right angle triangle or something at 90 degrees here. We know that anything that's at 90 degrees to the vertical is something that's gonna be considered quarter sawn. And then we're gonna go through that 90 degrees at about 30 degree increments and talk about our different cuts. So everything that would be in this pattern right here would be considered quarter sawn wood. Because again, the rays are anywhere between 90 to 60 degrees of that vertical piece. In this plane right here, this is what would be considered flat sawn. And, and actually we can see here that this is gonna be more of a quarter sawn because of the pattern, but up here we can see where the flat sawn would be because the rays are running parallel to the width of the board. And, and the smile is kind of upside down it, it, here. Exactly, exactly. Yes. And so as we see, move through the different parts of the log, we can see where the flat sawn portion of the wood would be. And then here is where we get into the rift sawn, which is anywhere between 30 and 60 degrees from that 90 degree vertical. So you have a board coming out of here, then the end grain is going to be pretty much 90 degrees to, to the face of the board. Right, so all of our boards are actually gonna come out like this. Yeah. So we then look at the different grain orientations to see what they're gonna be. So here we're gonna have flat sawn, here we're gonna have flat sawn, this will probably also be flat sawn, and then we'll get into rift sawn, rift sawn, and then quarter, 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 quarter as we go through it. What's interesting is, is each different type of cut will produce a board with different grain patterns as well as different structural um, characteristics. Your flat sawn, because of the way the grain runs perpen or excuse me, parallel to the face of the board, will give the face of the board more of what they call a cathedral grain, to where you'll see the towers, so to speak, as you go through it. And as we do our sure. cuts, you'll be able to see that. Yeah. As we get into the rift sawn cuts, you'll see grains that are actually very straight and very true and very linear with the face of the board. And then, of course, the quarter sawn boards are where you actually get the show, if you will. You get the medjieri rays that begin to pop through and really show that lace wood effect. 
Um, a lot of people that do mission type furniture or shaker wood type furniture really like the show of that. And of course, it's a very structurally sound board. What's interesting is that this board, the quarter sawn board, will be the truest board for the furniture maker. In other words, it will have the least amount of movement as it dries and as you put it into the furniture piece. More stable. Exactly. It, stability is the key because of the orientation of the grain pattern. Um, the rift sawn will have similar stability, it'll just have a different show. While the flat sawn for the furniture maker will have the least stability, but interestingly enough for the construction worker, for the guy who's building things, this is actually the most desirable piece of wood for a couple of reasons. One, it will actually hold a nail better than a quarter sawn wood because of the orientation of the grain. If you think about a nail being driven through it, you're actually tying it into all of the rays, as well as it actually has more vertical load bearing capacity. And that's why they use it as rafters and as beams for support beams underneath a house. You want to look for a flat sawn board if you're going to be building something out of it versus structurally wise versus a quarter sawn board to be making furniture from. That's wonderful information. I never really thought about it that way. But yep. Now, so how do you start? So, so what we'll do is we'll look at the log and we want to take into consideration several factors as we look at the log. Of course, we want to consider the outside bark and then the sap wood and we want those eliminated from the cuts. Then we want to look at, okay, what's the orientation of the log and how can I maximize it? And we want to consider this part right here of the log, which is the pith. And so we want to cut, make sure that we cut that pith out of any usable lumber that we would use, simply because you're going to get cracking and splitting there. And then any other thing that would come into play with the log, such as this particular crack right here, we would want to take into consideration as we use it. All right, so if we just uh, slice this off as a board, it would be... Uh... Uh, it would be flat sawn. That is correct. And we'd see the little cathedrals and so forth. Yep, absolutely. So here we've got, um, we'll call it 11 and a quarter inches from the top down to this, actually about 11 inches. Mm -hmm. And then on the back side, I have got 10 inches down. So I've got about an inch to take off of this side as compared to this. And that's the taper of the tree. Correct, correct. Yeah, the, the, just the taper of the log from the butt end as it grows up into the log. Okay. And so this log does not have a great deal of taper to it, which is a good thing because there's not going to be that much waste to it. So what I'll do is I'll actually lower the rail about three quarters of an inch on this side. Um, this will automatically lower a little bit. So that'll give me um, what I should need as far as getting ready to make my board cuts out of this. For red oak, a really nice grain pattern um, for a flat sawn board. They show very nicely. But you can see here, in particular, the cathedraling effect that we were talking about. Yes. Um, and you can see here a spot where we have cathedraling going in both directions and then a circle. This is actually where, at one point in time, the tree attempted to grow a limb out of it. But for whatever reason, it stopped. So we've got our two flat sawn boards off. I'm going to finish cleaning up the top of the log, and then we'll switch over and we'll do some riff sawn and quarter sawn boards. All right, let's do it. See here where we're getting more of that riff sawn look to where you're getting very straight linear grain versus the cathedraling that comes from the flat sawn board. All right, we're down to the show boards now. Absolutely. So as you can see, Chuck, our pith is right here. And so like we talked about earlier, we're now getting the grain that's going to be perpendicular to the face of the board. And, and why we get the show um, is the tree is made up, of course, of a venous system, much like ours, and they're called medullary rays, and they carry the nutritional substances to the tree. And so they run literally like this. So as we expose the face of the board, we are in essence cutting off the end of the medullary ray, mm -hmm. which is where we get that beautiful flex show or that lace wood effect that you can see. So as we take this off, we'll expose it, we'll take a look at it, and we ought to have a pretty good show of rays right through that board right there. Can't wait to see. Let's see it pop 
pumping. Oh, yeah. And so th this is the best part about being a Sawyer is literally I get to be one of the first persons to see what's inside the wood. And you can see literally just peeking through there, through that crack, all of those Medjieri rays putting on that beautiful show. Well, Ted, I see those medullary rays starting to pop through as it dries a little bit. Absolutely. So as the moisture evaporates from the surface, they will pop out more and more. And so we can really see a nice contrast between the three different types of cuts from a log right here. Here's your quarter sawn board. As you can see, the grain pattern is very straight, very consistent, and you have the rays or the show popping through. Here we have the flat sawn with the cathedraling and the the board, the grain pattern that's less tight and more sporadic. And then here we have the rift sawn with consistent straight parallel rays that will give a nice, stable, secure board for that woodworker. Well, that's what we're looking for. Thank you so much, Ted. Well, Ed, I understand that the uh, fret saw, which is aptly named, uh, has gone the way of the dinosaur. I think it has. There's some new innovations in saws that have come out, and the fretting part, I think, often with this, this product and, and other saws that are just a single piece like this that are bent, you can't get enough tension on the blade. So it ends up getting in the way of getting a good cut. Um, but we have a new product from New Concepts that has come out that is the Mark IV, and as you can see, that frame that frame can take a lot of tension. So it allows you to put a lot of tension on the blade so you won't get a turn or a spin in the blade during the cut. Mm -hmm. Look how thick it is. In New Concepts, you're right. Uh, if you compare it to the original uh, fret saw that they came out with, the frame is considerably thicker and that allows more tension to be applied to the blade. And a little different design. And a little different on the truss design. They do have another saw, actually, which is the birdcage fret saw. As you can see, that top truss design is really rigid. So sure. being made out of titanium, it's incredibly lightweight as well. I think you've got a lot of choices from the new concept products. Um, you have the availability of the depth of cut, and the MK3 comes in a three and five inch, and the MK4 comes in a three, five, and eight, and the birdcage titanium in a three, five, and eight as well. They all have the ability to have the quick action cam lock to loosen the blade and tighten the blade. There's just a lot of features. So you can kind of pick and choose as you need in the shop. You need lightweight or you need the highest tension, you can choose. Sounds great. I think I'm going to take this one home today. I'd be happy to do that for you. Thank you. Coming up. Sometimes I'll just use a cable and a curve on a wire. We're bending the rules with this layout design shortcut in fine woodworking magazine's finer points. To understand Jerry Spady, to get a little introduction, you have to start with things like this. See these little crowns on this cabinet? That's crown molding, Jerry Spady style. So let's find more uh, out about Jerry Spady the woodworker. This guy's really something. Stay with us. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. I'm just an average down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably about a 5. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here. And I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best-selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. What is quality? Is it quick? Forgettable? Easy? No, it isn't quick or easy. It isn't forgettable. Quality takes work. It takes time. Quality lasts. And it starts at Bell Forest, a leading global supplier of figured and exotic woods. Order online at bellforestproducts.com. Whiteside Machine Company has been in business for over 30 years, providing customers with quality American-made router bits. Fine Woodworking Magazine has declared Whiteside router bits 
best overall and best value when compared against 17 other brands. No matter the router application, they have the type and profile of carbide router bit you need. When you put a white side router bit to work in your shop, it is guaranteed to make you smile. Are your tools Tormac sharp? Tormac, consistent, reliable, and razor sharp. Tormac, sharpening innovation. Woodworkers count on American-made forest saw blades for smooth, quiet cuts every time without splintering, scratching, or tear-outs. The famous Woodworker 2 is the all-purpose combination blade, but for special cuts, Woodworker 2s are available for cutting dovetails, for flat bottom joinery, a 30-tooth blade is perfect for ripping, a 48-tooth blade for superior cross cuts, and a finger joint blade set. There is a perfect forest Woodworker 2 for every table saw cut. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for more than 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year-round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, just look in their catalog or go to highlandwoodworking.com. So we're here with Tim Coleman, and I was just looking around his shop and saw all these curves hanging up on his wall. And one thing I found really, really interesting was they're obviously shop made, and the turnbuckle on the end. Well, in uh, drawing a, a curve and uh, when you're designing something or laying out for a curved part, um, you know, like when I was in school or I was in a shop that had uh, other people around, you can just take a stick and bend it and then say, hey, could you come over and draw, <laughs> draw that. that for me on here? Um, but working alone, uh, I don't have that luxury. I tried holding the pencil in my teeth and that, <laughs> was, that didn't always go over so well. I've, I've seen people <laughs> drive nails mm -hmm. and then hold it, but then you're driving nails into a workpiece or something. Yeah, there's, just... there, yeah I've seen a, a number of innov innovative ways of, uh, of doing something like this. Um, but somehow I just uh, kind of came to this. Um, you, know, you can see on some of these, I, I just have a, a way of holding, holding the wire in place and, you know, altering the, the curve, oh, um, nice. you know, so it's, but it's not super precise with the turnbuckle. Um, I mean, this, this one, it's it, the only way to, to vary uh, the curve is with the turnbuckle because the ends are, are fixed. Um, but this is such a long curve that usually I'm, I'm making more, um, you know, gentle, gentle curves with it. And one, one thing that I love about the turnbuckle is um, I've, I've used store-bought curves before it's like the you're tightening up the straps to your backpack that, mm -hmm. that cinch or whatever and it's really hard to move it just a little bit yeah yeah and this turnbuckle you can really dial it in just very very precisely i i, I think it's it's brilliant well and it's surprising how it with the turnbuckle fully open and fully closed how much yeah. uh, change you have in that curve and then this one combines the best of both worlds. Oh uh, yeah, it does. You, know, it does, you, does. you can you can uh, pull in the wire quite a bit, um, and then fine tune it. So you've just got a piece of cable with a gob of solder. solder. Yeah, um, that so works you're, you're, pretty well. This one's got. This is a. I usually use bicycle cables. Oh. This is like a brake cable. Obvious reasons. Um, okay. Yeah, and sometimes I'll just use a cable and. Uh, <laughs> 
Very cool. And I mean, the, the other way that we really shouldn't leave out that you use all the time, I think. I do. I, I use it a lot. Um, this this is a, a great way for um, for creating uh, asymmetric curves. It's uh, a so ship's curve, right? Yep, yeah. it's a ship's curve. Uh, it's made up of uh, little staves that slide against each other. And in this case, I've put pieces of tape to restrict the uh, movement of the staves once I, once I have a, a, a shape that uh, I want to work with and transfer from one piece to another. Um, because often I'll use this if I'm laying out, you know, shapes for a leg, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, I'll, I'll use this to create one and then uh, make a pattern from it. Um, and so, yeah, these, these adjustable curves. Um, and, and it's nice to have different sizes and a number of them just because uh, usually in, in any given piece you've got more than one curve if it's a curvy piece. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not much cost or effort in making them. Very cool. Coming up, we'll take you to the heart of ingenuity. A moment with Jerry Spady. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. <laughs> For 35 years, Lee has manufactured the world's best joinery jigs. From our award-winning dovetail jigs and mortise and tenon jigs, to newer innovations like router table jigs. Easily add strong, beautiful joinery to your woodworking pieces, like half-blind dovetails, box joints, mortise and tenon joints, and through dovetails. Lee, simply the easiest and most versatile router joinery jigs. Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading bandsaws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power Tools. Moment with a Master is brought to you by Highland Woodworking. Fine tools since 1978. Let Highland's legendary wood slicer resaw blade help make it easy for you to get great results sawing thick lumber into thinner boards. The wood slicer is designed to cut much faster, smoother, and quieter than ordinary bandsaw blades. You'll be amazed at how smooth a surface you'll get with a wood slicer. Its variable tooth pattern greatly reduces noise and vibration. Order a wood slicer from Highland Woodworking for your bandsaw today. Now sit back and be inspired with our moment with a master. Jerry Spady, I'm excited to be here. I've heard so much about you. Uh, and it's kind of led me to a conclusion that you may be the Frank Zappa of woodworking. I'm not, <laughs> not sure about that. But I, don't, you, I have no rhythm. You, <laughs> well, there is a rhythm to your piece. When I was in high school, I was the science kid. You know, I took all the, all the science classes that the high school offered. As you can see, Jerry Spady's love of science and biology really shines through in many of his astonishing masterpieces. And when you hear about Jerry's previous career, it all starts to make sense. I have a, a, a long background in, in uh, well, basically trying to avoid getting a real job. So I was in school for a long time, <laughs> a long time. Yeah. And uh, I ended up getting trained as a, a, a basic researcher in biological sciences. And uh, So it sounds like a what if kind of life. Yeah, pretty much. And, um, and when I, when, I was in, when I was a bench scientist, 
I would try anything that I could think of to solve a particular problem that I was up against. Um, I take pretty much the same approach to woodworking today. What is this? This is one of my earliest pieces, actually. And I thought, well, what's the craziest thing, three-dimensional, fine dimension object that I can maybe create? And I thought, circulatory system. So I made this, and it lights up, and I lighten here. And it says and, this is a chest of drawers. Yes, this is a chest ah. of drawers. And, and the, the chest part is derived from a uh, picture in Gray's Anatomy, which uh, I made. These these are pretty realistic ribs. You got uh, sternum? The, uh, sternum, intercostal cartilage, and the rib itself. And they're the right number. Amazing. And then oh. you open it up and you can see... Um, the circulatory system, but then you have to understand... It said that chest of drawers. I don't a, get the drawers. Well, the drawers are, are kind of hidden. There's there's two drawers here, uh, which contain a little bit of marquetry, and uh, and then there's a hidden drawer that's back in here. Well, you have to have hidden drawers. Well, you have sure. to have hidden drawers. And then when I created the heart, the heart was, was carved from a two-dimensional picture, so I'm not so sure how accurate it is in three dimensions, but the heart actually comes off of here through a magnet system and then the heart opens up and here are the other three little drawers. Uh, Amazing. So this oh, is my, wow. my chest of drawers. Jerry's inspiration for his colorful and unique designs comes from a science experiment that he conducted more than 15 years ago. The result is a material that he calls fine ply. It's a homemade plywood made under some fairly specific conditions that I recognized had properties that I'd never seen before in either solid wood or plywood uh, that's available commercially. I had a supply of veneer uh, that I'd gotten and I didn't know how to use veneer and so the veneer sat for the better part of a decade in my shop uh, waiting for me to figure out how to use it and eventually I thought well if I try to make if I make it into plywood first then I can, I know what to do with plywood. I know how to use it. And so for 10 years I was making homemade plywood uh, with varying degrees of success. And then in 2001 I put this uh, homemade plywood, rather than try to clamp it the way I'd been trying, I put it into a vacuum bag and out popped this new material, which I'm pretty sure, uh, I haven't got any hard proof yet, but Pretty sure is uh, plasticized wood is what it amounts to, and and the the epoxy is the adhesive of choice. I've been I've been working with epoxy for well since sometime in the 80s. So the epoxy I'm assuming is infusing the cellular structure of the veneer, which is thin enough to to allow it to do that, and it's setting up inside the uh, the wood and creating a plasticized wood. This through is the a, vacuum process. Through, through it the kind vacuum of process. The, yeah, exactly. The air, the, uh, and, and it's replaced with the with, epoxy. With the epoxy, right. And that leads to characteristics that are, are as far as I can tell, unique uh, in this stuff. So you can cut small, uh, the small little items and not have to worry about short grain or or, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you can even carve them out. So. Yes, yes. Uh, it can be carved to uh, really exquisite uh, fine dimensions. Every time I think of some strange idea, uh, it works to my amazement because I'm trying to push this stuff to where it doesn't work and I haven't figured out the limits of it yet. This is just a unique cabinet. Not only do we have the crown molding Tell us what was going through your mind and, and what you did here. Well, I, I never intended to make this cabinet. Uh, this was uh, almost extemporaneous from the get-go. What I really wanted to do is make this little guy back in here, which is called a weedy sea dragon. And I'd been down to the Chattanooga Aquarium and I'd seen these critters. And I wondered for a couple of years, could, that, could it possibly be made uh, out of wood? And finally, I screwed up the courage and I tried to make one. And it was successful. And um, I liked it so much that I made a second one over here. So now I had two weedy sea dragons. I said, well, what do I do with these guys? 
And then I, de I decided, well, if I put them in a, in a bed of seaweed, uh, they would look like they're floating in seaweed, which they do uh, in nature. And so I made these long kind of filamentous uh, guys, and, and uh, they were successful. And then I put a case around it. And, and, and fine ply. This is all, all, all of this stuff is fine ply, everything, except for the seabed. The seabed's just a, a chunk of solid wood. This looks like something out of maybe the Hobbit uh, trilogy, Tolkien trilogy. Look at that. That is so unique. Uh, the dragons me. are appropriate for that analogy. Yeah, tell me about it. Well, uh, again, I was exploring form, and uh, I built a uh, kayak, a, a tandem kayak, some years ago. While I was making the, the structure of the kayak itself, it dawned on me that that same technique could be used in, in cabinetry. And so this curved form here is, uh, is created with uh, kayak technique. And it's a cove and bead, uh, small boards that are, are bonded together. They're covered in fiberglass. Uh, the fiberglass is saturated with the epoxy and you end up with a rigid structure. This is, this is not the original color. And that's color. the skin. That goes That's over. the skin that goes over the cabinet, uh, the cabinetry, and then from there, uh, it was a question of creating a box on the far side uh, that would house the shelves and the doors. And the uh, the doors again are are cut right out of this original structure. And uh, after that, it was a, a question of decoration for this particular cabinet. I had gotten to the stage where I was thinking of using fine ply not just in decorative effects but actually in structural effects and this is where my work is leading to now and this was one of the first pieces that uh, where I created I think three different curvatures of fine ply panels that were fairly large and then I put them on the floor uh, upright and I liked the overall shape uh, that that created and I thought, well, I could make a cabinet out of this. The, the fall panel is next to the winter panel, and the summer panel is next to the fall and the spring over on this side. And I tried to make imagery that was kind of reminiscent of each season of the year. Jerry Spady, the master woodworker who often dares to ask the question, what if, hopes that his showpieces inspire others to do the same. I, I guess I would like to like people to think that, that uh, the limits that we impose on ourselves in so many different ways, but particularly in a, in a craft as old as woodworking, uh, where it's, it's thought that all of, the, uh, all of the major forms have already been created and all the major techniques and on and on, it's not true. Uh, if we took this attitude in medicine, we would be, uh, well, we wouldn't have the things that we have in our back pockets today to help people. And, and I think any field, uh, there's always room for growth, there's always room for exploration. So, you know, to the next generation of woodworkers especially, I would hope that they would take a material like what I've created and just run with it and figure out how they can use it. Yeah. No limits. No limits, yeah. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. That's all the time we have for the show today, but Check us out on social media and come back to see us next time on The Highland Woodworker.